Welcome to the world of numbers. For today's topic, we will be discussing the reference ranges and conversion factors of the analytes that are commonly and generally tested in the laboratory. A reference range is a set of values that includes upper and lower limits of a laboratory test based on a group of otherwise healthy people. Though the term reference interval is usually the term preferred by laboratory and other health professionals, the more commonly known term is reference range. So that is the term that we will be using throughout this entire discussion. As we all know, class, reference ranges provide the values to which your healthcare provider compares your test results and determines your current health status. However, the true meaning of a test result, whether it indicates that you are sick or well or is at risk for a health condition, can only be known when all the other information your healthcare provider has gathered about your health. That includes the results of a physical examination, your health and family history, the recent changes in your health, any medications you are currently taking, and other non-laboratory testing. The reference range or reference interval needs to be established or confirmed when there is a new analyte that is measured, there is a new or a different analytical method used for that type of analyte, and there is a significant reagent change or modification by the manufacturer. Here are the five major factors to establish reference intervals. Number one, it is the makeup of the reference population that includes their demographics, the age, the sex, the genetic factors, and economic factors. Number two, the criteria in including or excluding individuals from reference sample groups. As we all know, in establishing a reference range, it actually requires a much larger population of samples to be tested, like around a population of 120 plus samples, more or less 120, is required, and that is already enough also. Once tested, the results are compared and the highest and lowest values, so those are called the outliers, are then eliminated. The range is then established from the remaining sample values. Third, physiologic and environmental conditions. This includes the time and date of collection, the intake of food and drugs, either fasting or non-fasting, the body posture during collection of blood sample, smoking, degree of obesity, and the stage of menstrual cycle during the event of uh, population sampling. Fourth is the specimen collection procedure. And lastly, the analytical method used in order to test that certain analyte. How does age affect the reference values? When you are still a child, enzyme levels are quite high because metabolism is also fast. And aside from that, you are still developing. Cholesterol or lipids are also higher in adults because probably that is because of diet. Next is proteins. So, proteins decrease as we age. And also, immunoglobulins, they increase at birth. For sex, under uric acid, the males have an increase or higher amounts than females. Testosterone, obviously, is increased in men, while estrogen is increased in females. Alkaline phosphatase are higher in females during the puberty stage. But ALP, 
increases with age. As for diet, when you have high fat diet or keto diet, I know that almost all of us here know what's keto diet, wherein we have an increased intake of fat or fatty foods or meat and lesser carbs, right? So that means you will get increased cholesterol levels. When you also apply a high meat diet, this increases urea, ammonia, and urates. Purine-rich food, such as some seafood, like tuna, sardines, anchovies, mussels, codfish, scallops, and organ meats like liver, um, kidneys, and thymus glands. But why would we eat that, right? But purine-rich food class... This also includes red meat. Huh? This can also increase urate. While banana, pineapple, tomato, avocado, chocolate can increase blood serotonin. As for medications, the usual oral contraceptives affect coagulation parameters and can as well increase thyroid hormone levels. The albumin and creatine kinase usually are increased after intense exercise. This also decreases in persons who are not physically active. Did you also know that myoglobin is increased when you do muscle injections or strenuous exercise? That involves heavy stomping of your feet on the ground. During pregnancy, the patient is expected to have an increased uric acid, cholesterol, cortisol, alkaline phosphatase, and LDH. There is also a notable slight decrease of calcium and glucose. However, there are also pregnant mothers that can get diabetes mellitus type 2, right? Remember that from your clinical chemistry discussion. This happens when the mother has gestational diabetes, correct? The personal habits and sedentary lifestyle of some of our patients include smoking, which can increase fatty acid levels, carcinoembryonic antigen, which is not just increased in smokers, but also in alcoholics, while gamma glutamic transferase is increased in chronic alcoholism. Heavy alcohol consumption and taking certain prohibited and prescribed drugs can also cause muscle injury and increase myoglobin in the blood. And lastly, body weight. When you have an increased body weight, the probable analytes that can also be increased are uric acid, cortisol, cholesterol, lipids, right? So when one has obesity, either male or female, there is a decrease in testosterone. There can also be an increased estradiol and estrone in women and decreased thyroid hormones for those obese patients. When there are normal reference ranges, expect that there are also critical and panic values. Critical or panic values are laboratory test results that exceed established limits either high or low. Critical results are considered life-threatening and require immediate notification of the physician, the physician's representative, the ordering entity, or other clinical personnel responsible for the patient's care. Critical results may also be referred to as the panic values. In the laboratory where I worked with before, critical results must be relayed first to the nurses so that they can communicate with the patient's doctor. This can also help the medical technologist on duty to know the general situation or the current state of the patient whether or not the results that we have in the laboratory coincides with the current state of the patient. 
If so, we relay it to the nurse and the nurse has asked permission to their doctors if ever that is already correct. And we can now be confident in releasing the results, especially, again, when we talk about critical or panic values. Okay, so here's the real deal. We'll be converting current reference ranges from conventional to SI units. So in the notes that I have given and in the PowerPoint presentation that I will be showing right now, we will be computing and analyzing some of the conversion factors and the reference ranges, whether or not they coincide. Okay, let's do that. Let's first tackle the basic clinical laboratory conversion that involves length, volume, and weight. When we want to convert inches into centimeters, we multiply the value with 2.54. When we want to convert centimeters to inches, we multiply it by 0 0.39. To convert yards to meters, we'll use the value 0 0.91. While converting it back from meters to yards, we use 1.09. In order to convert gallons to liters, we use the conversion factor 3.78. While if we want to convert liters to gallons, we use 0 0.26. Fluid ounces to milliliters makes use of 29.6, while milliliters to fluid ounces makes use of 0 0.034. Ounces to grams is 28.4, while grams to ounces makes use of 0 0.035. The conversion of pounds to kilograms makes use of 0 0.45, while kilograms to pounds makes use of 2.2. Let's say we have 15 kilograms. How can we convert this number into pounds? Now the conversion factor that you need is this. One kilogram is equal to 2.205 pounds. So anytime you wish to go from kilograms to pounds, all you need to do is multiply the number by 2.205. Now if you need to go from pounds to kilograms, what you need to do is divide by 2.205 for those of you who like to get the answer quickly now for those of you who want to show their work uh, here's how you can uh, do it so let's start with this example let's convert 15 kilograms to pounds step one is to write down what you're given on a fraction step two write another fraction now using your conversion factor you need to decide what goes on the bottom and what goes on top notice that we have kilograms on the top part of the first fraction so we want to put that same unit on the bottom part of the second fraction so this part of the conversion factor, we're going to write it on the bottom so that these units cancel. The other part, we're going to put it on top of the second fraction. And so that's how we can show our work converted from kilograms to pounds. So it's going to be 15 times 2.205. And the answer is 33.075 pounds. So that's how you can convert from kilograms to pounds. Now let's try another example. Go ahead and convert 24 kilograms into pounds. Feel free to pause the video if you wish to and try that example. So let's start with what we're given, 24 kilograms. And then for the next fraction, we're going to use the same conversion factor. So we're going to put this part on the bottom, 1 kilogram, so that these units cancel. And then 2.205 pounds on top of the second fraction. So it's 24 times 2.205. And the answer is 52.92 pounds. So that's it for the second example. Now, Let's work backwards. Let's convert pounds into kilograms. So using the same conversion factor, go ahead and try that. So when you want to go from pounds to kilograms, you need to divide by 2.205. So we have 12 pounds. Let's put it over 1. And this time, since we have the unit pounds on top of the first fraction, on the bottom part of the second fraction, we're going to put this portion of the conversion factor. So we're going to write 2.205 pounds here. And then on top, we're going to put 1 kilogram. So the unit pounds cancel, and because this number is on the bottom, that tells us that we need to divide 12 by that number. So 12 divided by 2.205 gives us the answer we're looking for, which is 5.442 kilograms. We have 15 pounds and 
eight ounces. How can we convert this to kilograms? What do you think we need to do here? Now keep in mind that one kilogram is 2.205 pounds. In addition to that, you need to know that our one pound is equal to 16 ounces. So there's two conversion factors that you need. So using those two conversion factors, how can we convert 15 pounds and 8 ounces into kilograms? So go ahead and pause the video and think about it. Try to find a way to get the answer. Well, the first thing we want to do is you want to convert ounces to pounds. So let's do that. A simple way to convert from ounces to pounds is to divide by 16. But let's set it up first. So because we have the unit ounces on the top, we're going to put it on the bottom. So we're going to write this part on the bottom. The other part we're going to put it on top. So the unit ounces cancel, and it's going to be 8 divided by 16, which is a half or 0.5. So 8 ounces is 0.5 pounds. So 15 pounds and 8 ounces is going to be 15.5 pounds. You just got to take this number and add it to this one. So what we're really doing is converting 15.5 pounds into kilograms. Now this is something we can do. So let's go ahead and finish the problem. So we're going to use this conversion factor now. So 1 kilogram is equal to 2.205 pounds. So the unit pounds will cancel, and the math is going to be 15.5 divided by 2.205. And that gives us an answer of 7.029 kilograms. So that's how you can convert from pounds and ounces into kilograms. Now, let's try another example. For the sake of practice, go ahead and convert 14 pounds and 12 ounces into kilograms. Go ahead and try that based on the last example. So let's start with 12 ounces. Let's convert that into pounds. So keep in mind, there are 16 ounces in a single pound. So we need to divide 12 by 16. And this is going to give us 0.75 pounds. Next, we need to combine these two numbers. So we have a total of 14.75 pounds. So now let's take that number and let's convert it to kilograms. So we know that one kilogram is equal to 2.205 pounds. So we could cross out the unit pounds and get our answer. So it's going to be 14.75 divided by 2.205. And so the answer is 6.689 kilograms. And that's basically it for that example. So now you know how to convert from pounds to kilograms, kilograms to pounds, and pounds and ounces into kilograms. I am pretty sure that you have mastered the basic clinical laboratory conversion when it comes to temperature. Converting Celsius to Kelvin, Celsius to Fahrenheit, and even Fahrenheit to Celsius and whichever way you wanted it to calculate. So let's say if you want to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. It's simply a one-step process. But if you want to go from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, you need to convert it to Celsius first and then to Kelvin. Likewise, going from Kelvin to Celsius is simply a one-step process. But to go from Kelvin to Fahrenheit, it's easy if you find the Celsius temperature and then convert it to Fahrenheit. So you want to do it in that order. So let's say if we have a temperature of 212 Fahrenheit. How can you calculate the Celsius temperature and the Kelvin temperature at the same time? Now first, let's calculate the Celsius temperature. The equation that you want to use between Fahrenheit and Celsius is this equation. The Fahrenheit temperature is 1.8 times the Celsius temperature plus 32. So in this case, since we're looking for the Celsius temperature, plug in the Fahrenheit temperature into this variable. So it's going to be 212, and that's equal to 1.8 times the Celsius temperature, plus 32. If you want to, you can write the equation as F is equal to 1.8 C plus 32. It might be easier to write it that way. So, let's write it like that. So I'm just going to put a C here instead. So let's solve for C. Let's subtract 32 from both sides. 212 minus 32, and that's going to be 180. Now our last step to solve for C is to divide both sides by 1.8. And it turns out that 180 divided by 1.8 is 100, which is the boiling point of water. So water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, or 212 Fahrenheit. Now the next thing that we need to do is convert the Celsius temperature to Kelvin. How can we do that? What equation do we need? It turns out that the Kelvin temperature is simply the Celsius temperature plus 273.15. Now most of the time you could ignore the 0.15, but it is there. We're going to say just 273. So 100 plus 273 is 373. So this is the Kelvin temperature. And that's how you convert from Celsius to Kelvin. Simply add 273 to it. So now it's your turn. Feel free to work on this example. Let's say if you have a temperature of negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
we go ahead and calculate the Celsius temperature first, and then calculate the Kelvin temperature after that. And then when you're done, unpause the video and see if you have the right answer. So let's go ahead and begin. Now we know that the Fahrenheit temperature is equal to 1.8 times the Celsius temperature plus 32. So let's take this number and replace F with it. So negative 40 is equal to 1.8 times C plus 32. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to subtract both sides by 32. We need to perform the opposite of addition. The opposite of addition is subtraction. And these two numbers will cancel. Negative 40 minus 32, that's negative 72. And our next step is to divide. Since 1.8 is multiplied to C, we need to do division. Division is the opposite multiplication. So at this point, we need a calculator. Negative 72 divided by 1.8 is negative 40. So this is the one temperature where the Celsius and the Fahrenheit temperature will be the same. Negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as negative 40 degrees Celsius. Now the last step is pretty straightforward. Let's convert negative 40 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. To do that, all we need to do is add 273. So what is negative 40 plus 273? Negative 40 plus 273 is the same as 273 minus 40. You can reverse the numbers. For example, 5 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 5. 5 plus 3 is 8, 3 plus 5 is 8, so we can reverse it. So 273 minus 40 is 233. So this is the Kelvin temperature. Now let's work backwards. Let's say if we have a temperature of 298 Kelvin. How can we convert it to Celsius and then convert the Celsius temperature back into Fahrenheit? So let's use the equation Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. In this case, if you're solving for the Celsius temperature, it's Kelvin minus 273, and that's equal to the Celsius temperature. So all we got to do is subtract 273 from 298. Well, let's write it this way. 8 minus 3 is 5. 9 minus 2, I mean 9 minus 7, wow, that's 2. 2 minus 2 is 0, so this is uh, 25 degrees Celsius. That's equal to 298 Kelvin. So now let's convert the Celsius temperature to Fahrenheit. So let's use the equation Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times the Celsius temperature plus 32. So this time, we just need to plug in the Celsius temperature for C. So it's 1.8 times 25 plus 32. 25 times 1.8, that's 45. And 45 plus 32 is 77. So the temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. That's equal to 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. Here are also another basic clinical laboratory conversion when it comes to concentration. Calculate the molarity of the solution or the concentration of the solution. So first you need the equation. Molarity is equal to the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. So it's moles divided by volume. Now you need to know what is meant by the term solute and solution. So let's say if we dissolve salt and water. Individually, the salt is the solute. Water is the solvent. The solvent dissolves the solute. And together, the combination of the solute plus the solvent is the solution. So keep that in mind, so that'll help you to distinguish the solute from the solvent. So now let's work on uh, this example. Let's focus on part A. 0.25 moles of sodium chloride in 300 milliliters of solution. What is the molarity of that solution? So we're given everything that we need. We have the moles of the solute. Sodium chloride dissolves in the solution, and we have the volume of the solution. However, we need to convert it to the unit's liters. And to convert milliliters to liters, simply divide by 1,000. One liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. So 300 divided by 1,000, it's 0.3. Another thing that you can do is move the decimal three units to the left. So let's divide this by 0.3 liters, and 0.25 divided by 0.3, that's about 0.83. So that's the concentration of the first solution in part A. Now let's move on to part B. Now keep this in mind, molarity is moles of solute divided by liters of solution. This will be helpful throughout parts B and C. So for part B, I'm going to do more of a conversion process. Let's start with 60 grams of sodium hydroxide. Now I need to get moles. I want to have the unit moles on top and on the bottom, the unit liters. So let's convert grams to moles. And we need to find the molar mass of sodium hydroxide to do that. So we need to add up the atomic mass of sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. So sodium is about 22.99. Oxygen is 16, hydrogen is 1.008. So this is 39.998. But for all practical purposes, let's round it to 40. So we can say that one mole of sodium hydroxide has a mass of 40 grams. So now we no longer have the unit grams of sodium hydroxide. Now all we need to do is take the moles and divide by the liters. But we need to convert 250 milliliters to liters. So if you take 250 and divide it by 1,000, you'll get the volume in liters which is 0.25 liters. 
So notice that we have the unit moles on top and liters on the bottom. Whenever you have that, your answer is the concentration in molarity. So it's 60 divided by 40, and then take that result divided by 0.25. So the concentration is 6 molar, or 6 moles per liter. So that's the answer for part B. Part C. Let's find the molarity of the solution when 700 milligrams of potassium iodide is dissolved in 200 milliliters of solution. So let's start with what we're given. Now we need to convert milligrams to grams and then grams to moles and then take the number of moles divided by the liters. One gram is equal to a thousand milligrams. And now we need the molar mass of Ki. The atomic mass of potassium is 39.1 and the atomic mass of iodine is 126.9. So the sum is 166 grams per mole. So one mole of Ki has a mass of 166 grams. Now the last thing we need to do is take the moles divided by the number of liters in the solution. So 200 milliliters, if you divide that by 1,000, that's 0.2 liters. And so that's going to give us the answer. So it's 700 divided by 1,000 divided by 166 divided by 0.2. So the concentration is 0 0.0211. So that's the molarity of the potassium iodide solution. Number two. 50 milliliters of ethanol is dissolved by 400 milliliters of water. What is the concentration of ethanol in the solution? So, which one is the solute and which one is the solvent? The solute is dissolved by the solvent. The solvent is water in this problem. The solute is ethanol. Typically, the solvent is usually in greater quantity than the solute. We have a lot more water than ethanol. So, water dissolves ethanol in this case. Now, in order to find the concentration, we need to calculate the moles of the solute. So, we got to get the moles of ethanol and then divide it by the liters of the solution. Now, if you recall, the solute plus the solvent combined makes up the solution. So what is the volume of the solution? We have 50 milliliters of solute, 400 milliliters of solvent. So therefore, we have 450 milliliters of solution. And if you divide that by 1,000, that's 0.45 liters of solution. So we're going to use that later. So now we need to focus on finding the moles of the solute, which in this case is ethanol. So we have the volume and we have the density. Combined, we can use that to get the grams of ethanol and then convert that into moles. By the way, here's the formula for ethanol, C2H5OH. So you can always look that up on the internet or something. So let's start with the volume of ethanol. We have 50 milliliters of ethanol and the density of ethanol is 0.79 grams per milliliter. So now we have the mass of ethanol in grams. So now we can convert that to moles, but we got to find the molar mass. So ethanol contains two carbon atoms, six hydrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom in a single molecule. So this is 2 times 12.01 plus 6 times 1.008 plus 16. So this adds up to 46.068 grams per mole. So that's the molar mass of ethanol. So one mole is equal to 46.068 grams. Now the last thing we need to do once we have moles, is to divide by the number of liters, which we know it's 0.45. So once you have these two units, moles divided by liters, you now have the molarity of the solution. So it's 50 times 0.79 divided by 46.068, and then take that result divided by 0.45. So the concentration is 1.905. So that's the molarity of the solution. Number three, the concentration of aluminum sulfate is 0.3 moles per liter. What is the concentration of the aluminum and sulfate ions? Well, first, let's write the chemical formula of aluminum sulfate. Aluminum is found in group 3A of the periodic table, so it has a positive 3 charge. And sulfate is one of those polyatomic ions that you should know by now. It's SO4 2 minus. And so the chemical formula is going to be Al2SO4 3. And the concentration is 0.30 moles per liter. So based on that, what is the concentration of the aluminum plus 3 cation? So notice that we have a subscript of 2. So it turns out that to find it, all you got to do is multiply the molarity by 2, so it's going to be 0.60. And in the case of sulfate, there's 3 of them per form a unit, so it's going to be 0.30 times 3, which is 0.90. Now, for those of you who need to show your work, here's what you can do. The first thing you should do is write the dissolution of aluminum sulfate. 
aluminum sulfate breaks down into two aluminum cations and three sulfate ions. So you can say this is the solid phase, and on the right, the aqueous phase. So I'm going to represent this as 0.3 moles of aluminum sulfate per liter, because that's what it is. Molarity is moles per liter. Now we can use the molar ratio to convert from, I'm going to use sulfate as an example. So from aluminum sulfate to sulfate, it's a 1 to 3 ratio. So for every 1 mole of aluminum sulfate that dissolves, 3 moles of sulfate ions are released into the solution. So the unit moles of aluminum sulfate will cancel. So now what you have left over is moles of sulfate per liter of solution. So it's 0.3 times 3. And so this will give you 0.9 moles per liter, which you can say that's 0.9 molar sulfate. So that's the concentration of sulfate. That's how you can show your work if you want to. But the simplest way to get the answer is to take 0.3 and multiply by the subscript, and that will give you 0.9. The next part of our lecture is about common analytes measured. I will give this as a form of a reading assignment for you so that we can proceed to the general analytes measured. Anyway, the common analytes here are some of the analytes that we will also be discussing in the general analytes measured. I just made it a summary since these are the commonly tested analytes in the laboratory. Let me discuss to you the general analytes measured in the laboratory. In order to understand the given diagram I have provided for you, it is like this. When testing for acetoacetic acid using serum as the specimen, when done qualitatively, the results for conventional and SI units are negative. That means that's the normal reference range or reference result for acetoacetic acid qualitatively. When done quantitatively, meaning it requires numbers as a result, still the specimen use is serum. This means that the result in the conventional units is 0 0.2 to 1 milligrams per deciliter using a conversion factor of 97.95 giving it an SI unit result of 20 to 100 micromoles per liter. Let's proceed to albumin. You can see from there that it is qualitative meaning it makes use of different methods to acquire certain results. All the three of these methods makes use of serum as the specimen. So when albumin is tested using salt fractionation, the result is 3.2 to 4.5 grams per deciliter. Using a conversion factor of 10, it becomes 32 to 45 grams per liter. If tested using electrophoresis, the result is 3.2 to 5.6 grams per deciliter. And when using eye binding, the result is 3.8 to 5 grams per deciliter. Still makes use of 10 as the conversion factor for all the three methods. In here, class ha, I'm helping you understand the table. So let's proceed to barbiturates. 
the specimens used there either serum, plasma, or whole blood. The result of this as an unacceptable reference range is negative for both conventional and SI unit. For blood gases, I made use whole blood as the specimen of choice. I provided all the three pH, PCO2, and PO2. Each of them have both arterial and venous acceptable range results for the samples. Same for carbon dioxide content. There's whole blood for arterial and whole blood for venous. There's also, also plasma or serum for arterial and venous samples. For this slide, there's cholinesterase or pseudocholinesterase. As you can see from this slide, cortisol has two acceptable reference ranges because we differ in the concentration, especially during the time and day of the specimen collection. If it's morning or 8 to 10 a.m., the result usually runs around 5 to 23 micrograms per deciliter. But if taken in the afternoon, that's around 4 to 6 p.m., the reference range runs around 3 to 13 micrograms per deciliter. It makes use of 27.59 as the conversion factor, giving 138 to 635 nanomoles per liter in the morning and 83 to 359 nanomoles per liter. That's in the afternoon. For protein electrophoresis, I have provided both the percent concentration of total protein and the other one is its concentration in serum. For glucose tolerance tests, there's both oral and also intravenous administration of the glucose concentration. This is usually done for pregnant women and also those who will be still for diagnosis for diabetes mellitus. Next is check out hemoglobin class. There's a sample or specimen of choice serum or plasma giving out both qualitative and quantitative results. However, when using whole blood as a sample, there are separate results for female and male. So, let's go first to serum or plasma. The qualitative acceptable result is negative. And for quantitative, it's 0 0.5 to 5 milligrams per deciliter, making use of 10 as a conversion factor, giving it 5 to 50 milligrams per liter as an SI unit result. For the whole blood, female is 12 to 16 grams per deciliter, while male is 13.5 to 10, I mean to 18 grams per deciliter, still making use of 10 as a conversion factor. For insulin tolerance tests, the fasting result is the same as the fasting result for glucose, 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. As you can also see, they have the same conversion factor, 0 0.05551. For lactate dehydrogenase class, when you see L, arrow P, that means from lactate to pyruvate, that's a method used to get 80 to 120 units at 30 degrees Celsius. For pyruvate to lactate, that's 185 to 640 units at 30 degrees Celsius. There's also another method for lactate to pyruvate using 37 degrees Celsius as the temperature, giving it 100 to 190 U per liter. So 
For both the 30 degrees Celsius temperature, the conversion factors used is 0.48, while lactate to pyruvate using 37 degrees Celsius has 1 as a conversion factor. For lipase, there are actually two methods stated from the reference textbook that I used. If you use the analytical method Cherry Crandall, it gives a result of 0 to 1.5 U per ml and also makes use of 278 as a conversion factor. While if you use the other method, which the reference textbook that I used did not disclose, has 14 to 200 MU per ml and has a conversion factor of only 1. In this slide, for magnesium, it makes use of serum as the specimen of choice. And if ever, you make use of 1.3 to 2.1 milli equivalents per liter, you have to use the factor 0 0.5000 as the conversion factor. But if you use milligrams per deciliter, you have to use the conversion factor 0 0.4114. Commonly in the laboratory class, I just want to inform you that we use milligrams per deciliter. As you can see in salicylates, normally the results must be negative. But if a patient is prescribed to take this, there's also a therapeutic interval and so that's 15 to 30 milligrams per deciliter as the normal reference range using a factor of 0 0.07240 giving it a 1.08 to 2.17 millimoles per liter as the SI unit result. You might wonder why testosterone results has both male and female. Just for the information of everyone, testosterone is one of the responsible hormone for libido and hair growth. One of the many hormones that is responsible for both of those. Just a gentle reminder, you must, if not memorize, familiarize all of the normal reference ranges for the commonly measured analytes in the laboratory. Not just the normal reference ranges, but also their conversion factors. Kindly take a look at vitamin A tolerance. Using serum as the specimen of choice, the result is 15 to 60 micrograms per deciliter. The patient is required to fast for 3 or 6 hours after administration of 5,000 units of vitamin A per kilogram body weight of the patient. The expected result is 200 to 600 micrograms per deciliter and makes use of 0 0.03491 as the conversion factor. And for this slide, kindly take a look at silos absorption. Serum normal results is around 25 to 40 milligrams per deciliter. That's 1 to 2 hours post-administration of the silos. If the patient is an adult, it is administered at 25 grams D silos. But if the patient is a child, they give 0 0.5 grams D silos per kilogram body weight of that child. So if the patient has malabsorption, the maximum result is around 10 milligrams per deciliter. The conversion factor for silose absorption is 0 0.06661. Just additional information class, the value in your conventional units must be multiplied to the conversion factor in order to get the recommended SI unit. That is it for the first part of our discussion regarding reference ranges and conversion factors. Stay tuned for part two 
as we discuss urine and other body fluids, conventional units, and their conversion factors, as well as their recommended SI unit values. So keep safe and God bless us all. Thank mm-hmm. you.